Hello and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands Region vlog and podcast. My name is Joss Brownlee and I'm joined today by Anil Chandler. Anil, welcome. Great to have you here. Great to be here. Excellent. Uh, Anil is an associate partner and chartered mechanical engineer, program manager and project team leader at Bailey Garner, an M&E consultancy in Birmingham. Throughout his career, he's gained experience in designing heating, ventilation, drainage, gas, renewable systems, domestic hot and cold water systems. He provides design, specification and technical advice to clients in many sectors, such as healthcare, blue light, education, commercial and residential. That's quite an introduction. Uh, what's today had, had in store for you? I'm uh, predominantly sitting on the M6 for about an hour and a half, but uh, other than that, we went to look at a couple of sites, let's go about some new projects. That wasn't uh, your, your commute into the office this morning? No, no unfortunately not. I only live around sort of 10 minutes away from the office, but oh, okay. was uh, going up north to have a look at some projects, um, some schools where we're doing some topical decarbonisation works. We're looking at building fabric improvements as well as ground source heat replacements. So, yeah, very interesting stuff. OK, so building fabric is the, the walls and the windows and uh, uh, floors and ceilings and roofs and that sort of thing. Yeah, so we were accompanied by accompanied by our sort of building surveying team as well, who sort of look at that those elements to bring the heat demand down. So obviously when we come to size the ground source heat pumping, whether it be sort of ground source or air source, we're, we're sizing for an adequate heat, heat loss. So that's that's why we kind of go for a fabric first approach. So um, what do you mean by ground source heat pumps? So that's basically taking sort of the heat from the ground to sort of uh, to serve a sort of heat exchanger, which would then in turn feed a thermal store, which will then feed your heating system and potentially domestic hot water systems. Again, it's a low carbon alternative to your traditional gas fired boiler, which you'll see in a lot of schools at the minute. And air source presumably takes it from the air. Yep. So same same sort of principles, but you're just getting heat from the air, not not the ground again feeds into an exchanger, which then feeds into a thermal store, which you can then use to, to provide hot water and heat space heating as well. OK, and you say they're renewables? Yeah, it, the reason why it's renewable is because it's not using sort of fossil fuel burning technology, similar to a gas fire boiler. So again, it's using ground where heat's constantly generated in the ground, which we can extract and use for the heating system. Same with the air. It's taking the temperature differentials and then applying that to our heating systems. Um, so we're not well, we're not damaging the planet, planet as much as we would be through using gas fired systems. OK, and they're, they're quite energy efficient, I hear. Yeah, I mean, if they're sized correctly and obviously everything and fabric first approaches undertaken, then yeah, they can be very, very um, effective. The problem you have is when you when you try to use these technologies in in buildings where you're not improving the fabric because your demand is quite high, which these systems tend to struggle with because they operate on a lower operating temperature than sort of gas fired boilers. So whereas a gas fired boiler would operate on an 80 flow and 60 return or 70 flow and 60 return, your heat pumps would sort of go to like 50, 55 degrees, which again would mean that you'd need bigger heat emitters and pipe work, which to kind of counteract that you'd look to kind of bring the heat demand down by by doing, as you mentioned, insulation, window replacements, wall insulation, roof insulation. And as a associate partner, do you get involved with the sizing of those, the, the calculations, the number crunching? Uh, yeah, I still, I still get involved in a few projects doing that. But again, we've got a team at Bailey Garner as well that, that work on that consistent of intermediate seniors and juniors. So we sort of share the load across the team. OK, how big is the team? So at the minute we have six, no, sorry, five mechanical engineers in the Birmingham office, two electrical, uh, and we have a similar size team in our London office as well. Okay, but we, also, we also have in-house sustainability. And you lead that team? Uh, I lead the Birmingham Mechanical and Electrical Department and uh, feed into the wider London group. OK, um, excellent. So uh, what could, how did you get into the industry? I actually took a bit of a sort of non-traditional route. I actually went to go and study architecture to, for a free year. Then at uni realised that it wasn't really for me. I prepared more sort of technical, more right and wrong. And so, so that's when I'd made the decision to move to mechanical engineering, but I sort of kept my passion for buildings as well. And that's what was like drove me to it in drove me to the building services and the construction industry. Um, yep. So I've been at Bailey Garner for about six years now. Uh, I've worked at previous consultancies and um, I've worked at a contractor as well. So I've managed to kind of get, get a bit of a rounded experience of the industry. Um, yeah. And that's where I'm at now. OK. And education, school, college, university years? Yeah, so I um I did a 
I did my A-levels at sixth form and then went to De Montfort University to then study architecture, which then I changed to do mechanical engineering at De Montfort. Uh, and then when I started to work for Bailey Garner a couple of years later, I then undertook my master's part time. Uh, I graduated, I think it was two years ago, uh, and then uh, got my chartership last year. Or might have been. No, sorry, it was 2020, I got my chartership. Years are just going by too quickly. Mid COVID. Yeah, but yeah, so I mean, that would that, that presented its own challenges, but yeah, I'm glad I got it done. And that was distance learning day release? Yeah, so because it was a two year course, I actually started it before COVID and then ended up finishing it during COVID. And yeah, yeah. it was it was distant learning and sort of doing coursework rather than exams. And that's a SIBSI accredited course to uh, get you straight into chartership? Yep. So because I did a CBC accredited undergraduate and master's, I was able to go through the sort of standard route for my chartership. OK. And you enjoyed that application process? Yeah, I thought it was very, um, very insightful. I thought it, it allows you to actually really look back at your career and actually really reflect on what you've actually learned and identify the gaps that you've got. And then the process of then solidifying what you know and having self-confidence by presenting it to two other engineers, um, I thought it was a really good experience. Yeah, personally, when I went through it, I took great pleasure and, and satisfaction in uh, undergoing that scrutiny from uh, industry peers and, uh, you know, people that, that, that don't know you from Adam um, to uh, verify how you think you are and, and uh, achieve those uh, that accreditations. But uh, presumably you were supported through that process by uh, mentors and, and um, other people. Is there anybody in particular you might like to uh, recognise for, for helping you along the way and, and supporting you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just sort of everyone at Bailey Garner sort of supported us. We're very, um, we're very hot on sort of growing your own and going through the ranks. I mean, our director sort of uh, equity members sort of started as a 16 year old sort of T-boy and now is an equity member. So he's he's very passionate about sort of supporting us in our development. And then obviously having the, the other principal and senior engineers that I could bounce ideas off and go through the process with uh, was really good. But I also thought that the guidance and the seminars that SIBSI actually put on were really useful for the process. Uh, the, the the clinics where you go through your actual application, that gave me a lot of confidence as well. So I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of support out there and I think it was it was quite, it was a good experience. Good. And uh, I hear you do um, some apprentices and training and, and graduates uh, at uh, Bailey Garner as well. And uh, anybody in particular there you might like to uh, recognise? Yeah, I mean, there's quite, there's, we've recently had two junior mechanical engineers that started with us, fresh from their master's degrees. Um, and they're getting on really well. So that's Jose and uh, our colleague, uh, Jake as well. They're, they're doing really well. Good. And uh, you you, re you recently joined um, the Yen uh, in the West Midlands region, the Young Engineers Network, and are, are currently uh, working to the other committee as well. Uh, what, what prompted you to uh, get involved with that? It was just more sort of feeling more involved within the SIBSI community and with my peers and getting involved in uh, a lot more of the events and doing a bit of networking with with people sort of like minded people. So it was a it was a good experience as well because you get to meet people from all different com companies or different backgrounds uh, or at different stages as well. So in the end, there's people that are just doing their university degrees now, people that have completed it, people that have sort of become principal level. So it, it, it helps to grow your network really. So I thought that was really useful. Good. And uh, any STEM or outreach activities? Yeah, I mean, at the minute we're currently, well, I recently did a presentation at the sort of UTC school in Wolverhampton. Um, again, Bailey Garner also sort of doing a uh, apprenticeship scheme as well, where we sort of interview uh, students from six forms and colleges, and then we give them opportunity to put sponsorship just to kind of grow the next generation of engineers, building service surveyors, quantity surveyors, project managers, and just really get that encouragement to, to join the construction industry. Good, excellent uh, to be commended, really, in in the in the current uh, climate. But um, initially, we started talking about ground source and air source heat pumps. Um, how do you engage in the work around the transition to net zero carbon? So at the minute, we we sort of do a lot of schemes. So there's a lot of funding schemes out there that are sort of public sector decarbonisation. So we we work with a lot of public sector clients. So we support them in sort of doing the feasibility studies, producing models for simulations, which would then work out the fuel displacement of the proposed system against the existing and then we were supporting putting case studies forward 
to en enable them to get grant funding because these types of systems can be quite expensive. Um, and then obviously we would then support them in doing the design. We also have supported sort of many clients over the years in doing heat decarbonisation plans for their estates. Now, in, in essence, that's a sort of doing similar exercises to sort of condition surveys, but it's doing a site survey, doing a model based on what's on their site, looking at the age and the condition of each unit and then proposing a, a low carbon alternative to enable that that client to become net zero in a set amount of time. And it's all to do with their targets and obviously a specific criteria that's set out because it's there's this fund such as a low carbon skills fund that's available for public sector clients to then fund these plans. So yeah, we're we're quite um we're doing quite a few of these E D decarbonisation plans at the minute. Okay. Um what about innovation? Um so in terms of innovation we we sort of do research into not just the, the typical gas fired boilers and the air source heat pumps we also look at feasibility studies into sort of electrical generation through wind turbines we're actually doing um an interesting project which i won't say the client's name due to obviously sensitivity and so on but we're, we're looking at um using farming waste products as a way of and, and fuel of regenerating heat so again looking at different ways to kind of get the end goal of sort of hitting net zero and finding other low carbon technologies that we can use okay um how do you see the roles changed over the past year or so i think of the last year as a so i've always sort of been a mechanical engineer but i've always felt you have to have an awareness of all the other disciplines such as electrical and sustainability but i feel now that every engineer needs to wear multiple hats and needs to have an awareness of sort of changing targets and uh, especially when it comes to sort of net zero low carbon and sustainability because i, th I feel it's a very topical subject at the moment um which i feel every engineer needs to have an awareness of and have an understanding because i feel that more standards are going to be geared at becoming net zero so it's making sure that we fully understand what the technologies are how we size them because we don't want to have a detrimental effect we want to have a positive effect on it and i think with these new technologies that are coming out we need to i think the engineers need to have that responsibility of making sure that they're aware of how these systems work and how we actually size them so that we can we can be so they can be as effective as possibly can what makes you feel inspired and like your best self i think co coming through the ranks at bailey and obviously through my university and some of the a lot of the sort of volunteering stuff i do i think i get a, a real sense of pride when you get sort of engineers that come in at junior levels and you can see them develop and you can see them actually start to get passionate about the industry for me that that gives me a good sense of pride that we're sort of helping the next generation as well as well because the way i see it, it's a bit of a cycle so there would have been older senior principal engineers that would have helped me as i was coming up through the graduate ranks and the junior ranks and i feel it's our responsibility to do that to the next generation as well so i think that that, that gives me a good sense of pride in, in 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 work and when we work on projects as well i think we recently at bailey garner we've we've published what our purpose statement is and our purpose statement is to have a positive impact on people's lives now that sort of transcends through it sort of everyone that works there because we're not just doing the projects for money we're not just doing it obviously because we like engineering but it's every project we do has some impact and we also want to make sure that the projects that we are doing has a Im positive impact on people and when you were in university studying architectural uh, and and were looking to move um what what how why did you decide mechanical rather than electrical or or any other forms of uh, engineering services i think i think it's because um term sort of sixth form and gcse's I was, I was really i was really drawn towards sort of design and technology and i see how systems work and how you design things in all, in all honesty, when I was doing design technology, I, I always thought I'd end up in a product design sort of role. But then actually going through architecture and actually looking at buildings, because um, that's what kind of affirmed for me that I was going to become a mechanical engineer. Because for me, it's, it's, it's with mechanical engineering, it's how we make the building work. It's sort of the heart and soul of building the heating system. It's keeping it, everyone warm. Someone actually said to me, when it comes to mechanical engineering, you'll only ever notice it when it's wrong. So you'll only ever notice it when the boiler's not working or the room's cold or you're not get you're not getting adequate air quality or if there's bad smells in the air. That and that's because if you're doing your job right, no one ever notices the systems. But it has a positive impact on people because it's it's making sure that they're they they're in the environment they're supposed to be in. And how what what comprises a, a typical day for you? Uh, I think my two no two days in the week are the same for me. I could be 
doing project work or I could be out meeting clients or doing sort of business related tasks for the for the business um, and I think that's why I enjoy the diversity I mean I, I'm not just looking at specific sort of doing heat calcs every day for, for five days in a row it's it's diverse I could be looking at a ventilation system one day I could be doing site meetings I could be doing client meetings I could be doing internal meetings um, yeah so it's the diversity that I enjoy. And what's the biggest project that you've worked on? Uh, I think I've worked on a as technical advisor on a new build school, which was like a hub development, which also had um, a school as one part, police station as the other, and a little centre as the other, all in one building. That was an interesting project because you had to work out how the control systems and how door entry systems and so on would work. And being a technical advisor on that project was was really interesting. A police station and a leisure centre combined with a school. Yeah, it was it's it's a massive sort of development hub building that they've sectioned off into three parts down in Mildon. Uh, so how many pupils ish roughly? I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was a secondary and six form, secondary school and, se and six form. And did you say swimming pool or leisure centre? Yeah, it was like a leisure centre facility as well, which sort of has sports. Also, as part of the agreement, the school would be able be able to access those facilities but the public would also be able to access them so it's making sure they had separate entrances and they could be all be safeguarded and again with the police station being on, on the same site and on, on adjacent to the buildings it was making sure that all the all access routes and all services spoke to each other as well so that's why each sort of party had their own technical advisors and we were on the sort of academy trusts um technical advisor role so uh students never crossing paths with the uh, policemen or their customers um, and never crossing paths with athletes and or only at certain times I guess. Yeah or even to general public because general public had access to the leisure facilities and it's it's things like when the fire alarms go off it's do all the doors open and, and is there a safeguarding risk for the for the trust um, and the school so yeah I mean it was really interesting because there's a lot of factors to think about. Yeah, and, and uh, communication with the stakeholders and being able to to um, uh, understand what their uh, key aspirations and, and drivers are and interpret them and apply them to m and &E building services as well. Yep. Uh, what's the one thing that you wish you knew before, when you started out? I wish I knew how sort of diverse the industry was as well. So it's very much you could start the industry as a mechanical engineer, but you can also change to become an electrical engineer or a sustainability engineer or go on the contracting side and be a, be a sort of project manager or so on. I wish I'd, I'd, I'd known that before and I wish I also knew about all the apprenticeship schemes that are available because that probably would have mapped my career slightly differently because I'm, I'm a strong believer that the apprenticeship schemes are out there that fund your university as well as giving you experience are 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 great they're I think they're, per they're perfect fit for young people looking to join the industry what what's the one common myth about your professional field that you want to debunk that all good engineers are gray haired and uh and old I mean I don't know if that is, is a common myth but from from what from other disciplines of what I've been told is engineers tend to sort of be the grey haired individuals that have got years and years of experience. But I do feel with the resources that you've got out there now, a lot of the tools that you've got for learning, uh, you you do find a lot of young engineers are really good and are up and coming and and can 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 really like you can see them having potential to be sort of masters of the field. So I feel I feel really excited about the next generation. Good, excellent. Uh, should we go quick fire? Yep. Favorite board game. Chess. Favourite website? YouTube. Favourite hobby? Uh, playing badminton. Favourite food? Um, chicken and chips. Favourite pizza topping? The pepperoni. Favourite film? Uh, pass, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't got a favourite film. Other than Villa, favourite sports team? Uh, be England, England football team. Um, favourite TV series? Yeah, probably Suits. Excellent. Um, what's your proudest moment or achievement? Uh, I think my proudest achievement was probably achieving my chartership. Uh, I feel like I worked hard to achieve that and uh, to actually get it during during COVID and obviously um, Fairly soon after my masters, I was, I was really proud of myself for doing that. Yeah, you do quite rightly so. 
Um, and what's the biggest challenge you have with your specific role right now and how are you going to overcome it? Uh, I think at the minute there's there's a lot of, I think the biggest challenge is educating clients around sort of decarbonisation. I think there's a lot of new technology out there, but I think clients are a bit wary of it still because it's not it's not the norm. Like as in everyone's used to a gas-fired boiler because we've had them for 50 odd years. Everyone is familiar with them, but going down that route and taking them along the journey of why sort of an SOC pump would be more beneficial and how to use those sort of systems. I think that's a challenge that the industry is going to face, not just not just ourselves. So, uh, but I think as as these technologies develop, that that part of the role will become easier. And uh, are you a member, other than SIBSI, are you a member of any other institutions or professional bodies? Nope, just SIBSI at the minute. And what about journals? Presumably you read uh, some journals and, and magazines and, and those sorts of documents. Yeah, no, I, I do read the monthly SIBSI journal that, that that gets released. I find the um, CPD elements are really interesting as well. And I think it's important for obviously keeping on top of, of developing technologies and, the, and basically the industry trends really. Um, so I think you mentioned badminton, so I'm, I'm guessing you play that and, and uh, keep your physical health uh, um, nicely in check. But uh, what about mental health? How do you stay positive? Yeah, I mean, it's just it's about sort of just allocating enough time to kind of unwind at the end of the day and on the weekend and sort of allowing time for reflection as well. So there's things I could have done better in a week, making sure that I do the next week. And that's how you stay on top of it, really. It's not, it's not all about work. It's not it's about having balance really and I think if you can find a company and teams that that promote that balance it's, it's a benefit I mean there's there's plenty of times when uh, ourselves and the team will go out and just unwind where it's got nothing to do with work it's just a social um, I think they're important. Good where do you see the industry going next what do you think the future holds? I think uh, the industry is going to go a lot more digital I think there's going to be a, a, a lot more uh, BIM presence uh, and I think a lot of the smaller companies as well will start to use BIM as well, as well as the bigger companies. And I think I think the two key topical elements of the industry at the minute are sort of decarbonisation and BIM. So I think there'll be a combination of that. And that's why I think it's important for engineers to kind of get familiar with BIM and not just sort of be old school hand-drawn notes and calculations. That it's about learning and developing as the industry uh, moves forward. Cool. Excellent. Well, Thank you very much for joining us and sharing uh, what you have today. Uh, just a couple of last questions, if I may. Uh, what do you like to do in your spare time? Uh, I like to sort of go out with friends, socialise, um, or just watch a good movie, just sit down and sort of do nothing sort of thing. So it's 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 how I feel really when I've got free time. And play the odd game of badminton? Yeah, well, I mean, I've not been playing recently. As I only recently had knee surgery, so I don't think I'll be playing for a while. But yeah, just playing sports as well. Recovering OK from that? Yeah, yeah, I didn't think it would take so long, but yeah, it's getting it's getting on. Yep, that's physio every month and just keep on top of it, really. Excellent. Good, good, good. And where can people discover more about you? Yeah, so I mean, uh, if you want to know more about me, I'm on LinkedIn or you can also look at the Bader Garner website. Uh, I've got a brief description about what I've sort of done and what I am doing. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Cool. Excellent. Well, as I say and previously, thank you very much for joining and sharing with us what you have today. Uh, if anybody watching or listening would like to share their thoughts with us, please don't hesitate to do so. Also, if you'd like to feature in a future episode or know of or can think of somebody that you'd like to find out more about or is an inspiration to you, please get in touch. Please like, comment and share. And we look forward to the next episode of the Sibsey West Midlands Region blog and podcast. Anil, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.